Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. Who there? It's the Fourth Amendment, baby. As the Constitution for Dummy series rolls on forward, wherever you stand on the issues, guys, we want you to stand smart. And that starts with knowing the text of the Constitution. So let's read it, let's interpret it, let's look at it. Giddy up, I'm ready to do the teaching, and you're ready to do the learning. Here, let's do it right now. All right, before we look at the words of the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, which is basically about search and seizure, we really want to give uh, credence to the British for getting us the Fourth Amendment because they were using something during colonial times called writs of assistance. And these uh, issued warrants based on basically just innuendo and reasonable suspicion were being exploited by the British to uh, go through suspected smuggler stuff. This is a reaction to kind of the taxing issue that's going on um, in the 1760s in colonial America and the British are pissed and they're going through our stuff and they're using these flimsy writs of assistance. So that experience, that experience of not having clear language about what gives the permission of the government to go through my stuff, my castle, turns into the Fourth Amendment. So let's look at the words, pay attention, they're really important, bang! The right of the people to be secure in their persons Houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. All right, so we have very specific language, and in a moment we're going to look at three basic questions. What constitutes search and seizure? You have to activate search and seizure in order to need that search warrant. And then B, if we do have enough evidence, what does that rise to in terms of probable cause? What does probable cause mean? And thirdly, what happens if the police ignore this? If there's not a good search warrant, um, is there any repercussions? So um, if we look at selective incorporation, and selective incorporation is this concept that um, the 14th Amendment and the clause, uh, the due process clause, no state shall deny its citizens due process, is going to create an opportunity for the court, through judicial review in the Warren Court, to basically take that Fourth Amendment and to make some universal kind of national rules about what search and seizure really means and what's going to occur if the police violate that rule. So let's take a look at the basic rules of search and seizure. What is search? So a court case called Smith versus Mary is what really defines um, whether search and seizure is going to rise to the level where you're going to need a search warrant. And basically what the court says is that two things have to occur before we even go to search warrants and then talk about probable cause. The first is, is that there's an individual expectation of privacy, that you expect what you're doing is guarded. And then second, that society expects that as well, that there's kind of a, a, a national um, acceptance of this principle that this activity is protected under the Fourth Amendment. These rules do kind of like a, a, a breathe a little bit. Let's look at how they breathe out and expand your rights. They expand your rights first in Weeks versus the United States, where basically what the court's going to say in 1914, that is if the federal agents find evidence illegally without a search warrant, you can't use that evidence at trial. And this is interpreting the words of the Fourth Amendment. Now, if you're a strict interpretationalist, and sometimes I'll hear people online talking about how we have to follow the letter of the Constitution, that there is nowhere in the Fourth Amendment a clause that states if you don't have a search warrant you find evidence, what happens to that evidence? So, Matt versus Ohio, 1961, is the court case that expands this to the states. We've talked about this in other lectures, selective incorporation. The court, using the 14th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment has this language, no state shall deny its citizens equal protection and due process under the law. So, in 1961, there was a little old lady named Matt and the police went to her house without a warrant. They were looking for a suspect in a crime, and she wanted a search warrant. They gave her a phony search warrant, and then they ripped the lady's house apart. And they ended up in her basement going through her drawers. They find a chest. They open it up, and inside is dirty magazines, obscene pornography at the time. Hashtag ew. 
she's a nasty, dirty little old lady. But in this court case, what she's going to argue is that no state, Ohio, shall deny me, Mrs. Mapp, due process under the law, meaning that if you don't have a search warrant, there has to be a repercussion, and that repercussion the court is going to decide is the expansion of the exclusionary rule. You've seen it on Law & Order a million times. So in Terry versus Ohio, guys, what the court did was they limited the Fourth Amendment by saying that the police didn't need a search warrant when it came to, to kind of these short-term encounters, that if the cops have reasonable suspicion to think that you're a flight risk or that there's evidence that you might be a danger to them or something like that, that they had the right for their own protection to do a pat-down and not needing a search warrant to do that or to stop you for questioning um, or maybe look in the glove box if they felt there was a threat there or something like that. What becomes interesting is that they do need reasonable suspicion. They need some type of fact to grab onto. So I've seen videos on YouTube. You probably can check out the link below. I'll put it in the description where um, a law student carrying a gun basically tells the police um, or asks the police, what right do you have to ask me anything? Right? What did I do wrong? And the cop says some people called and said there was a guy with a gun. He says, I was the guy with a gun. I have a license. Can I go? And he says, I'd like to see some ID. He says, I don't have to give you ID. Why well, am I going to give you ID? No, what did I do wrong? If I did something wrong, tell me what I did wrong, I'll give you ID. And he was really, really standing on the Fourth Amendment, saying that if this is a search and seizure, if you're stopping me and getting in the middle of my natural right life, you need a reason. So, I don't know if you should try it out there on the streets, guys, but that's what happened. So where do you have this expectation of privacy? And that's really what comes down to um, the Katz decision. This is really where they expanded um, uh, search warrants from not just a physical location, to, but to the individual. I believe that they had wiretapped the outside of a phone booth, and they were trying to get this dude, I guess, uh, Katz. And he went into the phone booth, he thought that he was having a private conversation, and it was being recorded. And the police said, we don't need a search warrant because we're not invading this guy's home. It's a public area. And what the, uh, the judges said in that court case was that there was an expectation of privacy. So if you have an expectation of privacy, then in a sense they need a search warrant. And of course we've defined that further by saying there's a societal expectation as well. Are there exceptions to search warrants? Of course there are. We can't you know, kid ourselves. For instance, there's the plain view doctrine. So if you have your curtains open and you're in the window and you are you know, stabbing the guy and you see the police and you're like, yo, what's up? Hey, yo, how are you? They don't need a warrant to come in, right? Not only is that going to be plain view, but that's going to be what's basically emergency circumstances. That's another rule. You don't need a warrant if someone's screaming bloody murder inside a home. You also have a consent exception. So, of course, this is what the police want you to do. You know, ma'am, do you mind if we look through the trunk? Yeah, you're done. They're going to look for the trunk and they have the legal right to. You also have court cases like U.S. versus Leon, which in the 1980s created a good faith exception to the, uh, to the search warrant. So if the police are acting in good faith and they think they have a good search warrant and they go to 400 Main Street when they should be going to 300 Main Street, but, I don't know, a raindrop hit the number, that the evidence seized at that wrong address is going to be used in court because the cops didn't do it with bad faith. It was an honest mistake. You also have the court case Nix versus Williams. In Nix versus Williams, you have the inevitable discovery doctrine. That basically, if you have a bad warrant, but they were going to find that evidence anyway, maybe they were doing house-to-house -house searches for some legal reason, I don't know, that that evidence can be put into trial as well. But there's also been some wins. Some wins for the people. Recently, there was a court case that examined whether or not the cops could put a GPS monitor on your car. And uh, that was struck down. They said, no, that you had an expectation of privacy when you're driving around, that you're not being GPSed. There was another court case where they couldn't get a search warrant, so what the cops would do is they bring drug dogs to the front of your door. And then the drug would be like, the dog would be like, rah, 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 drugs in the house. 
and they'd use that to get the search warrant. And the court struck that down. They said that was an invasion of privacy. The Fourth Amendment rocks the party that rocks the party. Because not only is it a great amendment to talk about when you're talking about your most very basic freedoms, your houses, your castle, but you have all of these current events which just kind of smack right into it. So what do you think? Is the NSA and what they're doing collecting data in order to protect us from um, terrorism? Is that a violation of the Fourth Amendment? Is there an expectation of privacy there on the internet? Is there a societal expectation of privacy? One other thing worth mentioning is the FISA Accords, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of, I believe it's 1978, created a special court system. So if there's some type of threat of maybe domestic terrorism with foreign influences, you know, invading the country or infiltrating the country, that you don't need to go through the ordinary ways to get a search warrant. You can go to the secret court. You can even go, I believe, 24 hours after that, the fact that you got the evidence, that you went in without a warrant, you get the warrant after the fact, and basically this secret court has approved thousands of search warrants with probably very little evidence and a lot of people don't know because it's not transparent. So there's certainly that to worry about too. So certainly that's kind of another layer on this monkey. Layer on the monkey. After 9-11, the FISA courts were expanded and using kind of the threat of terrorism, Bush and Obama have used the FISA court to kind of get around some of the probable cause restrictions that the Fourth Amendment has for domestic issues. Makes it a little bit easier. We probably went a little bit long, but it's the Fourth Amendment. What are you going to do? Make sure you check out other lectures. Make sure you subscribe. Description below. If you click that button, you'll go to the Constitution for Dummies series, and you can watch as many as you want. And certainly, if you uh, look down below, you'll find other EDU gurus that you should be checking out. And I've talked way too much. Fourth Amendment, stick a fork in it, baby. Knock, knock, knock. Who's there? Not me. Because where attention goes, energy flows. And I'm going this way.